The violet flame, when you invoke its power, you're starting to figure out how to properly use your vehicle, this human body suit, your thoughts, your words, your beliefs. All those things are are tools. They're not just part of your experience. They're literally manifestation tools. So when you start to use how this this body works in relationship to your to your consciousness anchored in the body you start to become a conscious empowered creator and that's what this life is that that's what evolution and, and thought and everything that's what everyone was trying to teach us we need to start having more respect uh for nature and for the environment and when we start having more respect for nature and the environment nature will start to say okay you know they're they're starting to get back to where they were uh, in, in Ireland, in ancient Ireland with the Druids or, or with the shamans, you know, in Africa and other places and in ancient Egypt. And now we can give our information back to them. This is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you so, so much for being here. In this episode, I'll be chatting with a 23-year-old Instagrammer from Chicago named Satchel McMahon. Satchel and I are going to shoot the shit over spiritual alchemy and some advanced mineral-based healing practices. But first, you're listening to the song Frequencies by VHS Dreams. My thanks to him for the track. There's a link in the show notes to the song on SoundCloud if you're interested. I have to say, too, that the title of the track fits the general theme of this episode and the next couple of episodes. Actually, it fits the theme of my entire life in the present moment, but more on that another time. Before we get to the conversation with Satchel, let me take a moment to set it up, if you don't mind. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, I really enjoy meeting new people, and I haven't always been that way. But I've come to know that there is something to be learned from everyone. And everyone and everything is my teacher on this journey of mine through this life. And I don't discredit anyone I meet up front because I don't know anything about them or their journey. It's a simple lesson, really, but one that took me many, many years to learn. But recently, I had a bit of a lapse with that mindset and found myself in a position of doubt and bias when I spoke with Satchel for this episode. And let me tell you why. In my previous podcasting life, I recorded an episode with a 22-year-old girl named Brie Marie who runs an Instagram account uh, with something like, gosh, like 15,000 followers. And the reason I talked to her was because she had posted a few things about sexual energy and this idea of sex being a sacred energy exchange. And to be honest, I thought, you know, talking to somebody about that would be a fun conversation because at the point that we recorded, I was just starting to learn about that myself. But I had no idea her age until we actually started recording, although it was still a fun chat and my most downloaded episode for that previous podcast, actually. But like I said, it was still a fun chat with a a new young voice who knew more about sexual energy at her age than I ever did. And Brie is what the Instagram crowd calls woke AF. And my guest this episode, Satchel McMahon, can be labeled with that same hashtag. Satchel actually follows Bree's account. I believe it's at Awake Alive Aware. He follows that on Instagram. So when I posted the episode and Bree shared it, he saw it, he listened to it, and then he reached out to me and just started casually chatting me up about a whole bunch of cool shit, really. I mean, things that I'm really interested in. Sacred geometry, advanced healing techniques, spirituality, alchemy. And then he just asked, he's like, hey, you know, can we record a podcast together about this stuff? And I was like, you know, I don't see why not. I I actually have a new podcast where this sort of conversation would fit well on. And sometime after this, he tells me that he's 23 and that's where my doubt and bias crept in. Because from that experience talking with Bree, I felt like we only scratched the surface of the subject and we didn't get into the topic in as much depth as I would have liked. 
And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, am I going to be able to have the type of conversation I want to have about this stuff with a 23-year-old? And I know how bad that sounds, and I don't mean to sound discriminatory on any level. But that doubt and that bias crept into my mind because, you know, while the format of my previous show was, it was very amateur, and I was really just kind of on training wheels trying to learn how to podcast. It was very conversational. And I told myself when I started this show, I wanted to be a little bit more serious, more professional. And I had to ask myself, you know, is this the sort of conversation that I want to present? But like I said, you know, I, I didn't want to discriminate against anyone based on their age or for any other reason, you know. So to sort of hedge my bet, I asked Satchel if we could just kind of casually chat over the phone for five or ten minutes before we actually scheduled a date and a time to record because I just wanted to feel this out. And when we got on the phone, five to ten minutes turned into about 45 to 50 minutes. And I was actually pretty impressed with his demeanor and his outlook and the overall knowledge base that he had. And I was impressed with the message that he told me he wanted to communicate. And when you hear it, you may think, well, this is like, you know, some woo-woo new age bullshit. And, you know, that's okay. Not every episode I put out there is going to be for every listener, but give it a chance. Uh, There's actually a really great message in here. And to be honest, what ended up swaying me to record this with Satchel was the very thing that made me doubt it at first. And it was his age because I had came across a note that I made when I was first starting to brainstorm ideas for this show and what I wanted it to be. And one of the first notes I made was I had jotted down the phrase new voices because sometimes I get tired of hearing the same voices talk about the same things. And in this little niche of the podcast world, you tend to get that. And the fact that someone of my age who has more than a passing interest in esoterica and the occult can hold a conversation with someone 10 years younger than me about these topics. Well, I think that's pretty rad, as we used to say in my youth. And to be honest, I don't think you have to be writing 700-page books to be a guest on a podcast. There are people out there that know just as much, that read and research just as much, that are just as well-spoken, and they may be 23 years old, you know? And as I said, I've come to know that you can learn from everyone you encounter on your journey, and this conversation was no exception for me. I hope you feel the same way. So sit back, relax, grab yourself an organic herbal tea, and... Enjoy my conversation with a 23-year-old Instagrammer from Chicago named Satchel McMahon. All right, Satchel McMahon, hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate your time. Hey, how's it going, Ryan? It's so good to be here. Awesome. So what we're talking about is your involvement, first of all, with the Cellular Matrix study. Could you tell people what that is and why you wanted to be involved in that? Well, first of all, it has over 3 million participants. Patrick McGeehan is the, is the founder of the study. Patrick started it about 20 years ago when his son was uh, very ill, almost fatally ill. And he was looking for something that could help save his son's life. So Patrick found sulfur and it saved his son's life. And ever since, he was on a mission to expose the the health benefits of this amazing mineral and distribute it to the world. So the cellular matrix study is one of the most revolutionary experiments going on concerning advanced health, and human nutrition. Sulfur plays a crucial role, and I cannot emphasize this enough. It plays a crucial role in the regeneration of our cells. Our cells regenerate all the time, and every seven years, you have a completely new body, completely made up of new cells that were not there seven years ago. Sulfur oxygenates the body, it decontaminates and detoxes the body of over 180 different contaminants. And so it's, it's a very, it's a giving and receiving type of health product and mineral and that it gives the body oxygen. It helps the body expand. And, and we all know that the body breathes, the skin breathes, you know, so it's very important to be able to 
get that oxygen flow throughout the body. And, and of course, most people know if you don't breathe, you die. So one of the most important things is the breath. And this, um, you know, of course, that relates into different spiritual practices with breathing. But nevertheless, sulfur oxygenates the body, decontaminates the body, and detoxes the body in ways that no other mineral or thing on the planet can do. And so they have found that cancer in particular is one of the diseases that is directly related to the lack of sulfur within the system. Now, I'm not saying that cancer cannot be healed or cured or it can develop from other means. I mean, we live in a very toxic and polluted world as it is right now. However, I do know that sulfur is the only is the first thing that I would go to when I'm trying to treat any form of illness. So basically, sulfur enables the transportation of oxygen across cell membranes. And oxygen is necessary for healthy cellular regeneration in mammals. So we're an organic living organism. And in order for us to, I guess you can say, evolve, I mean, because that's really what this is all about. That's what life is almost you know, based around is, is the evolution of a species, you know, the evolution of, of your consciousness and of your body, and they're all interconnected. You know, when you have a healthy body, you end up having a healthier mind, you end up having more, um, I guess you can say, expansive and happier thoughts for the most part. And things don't affect you as much. Usually when you have a very uh, cruddy, you could, you could even call it, or, or uh, diseased body, that uh, that you're very quick to react to to anger and, and different emotions really affect you much more than if you're healthy and they kind of almost just fall off. Plants, on the other hand, require carbon dioxide for cell regeneration, and plants can store sulfur while man cannot. See, now this is something that is important to understand. Plants can store and hold sulfur within them. Man cannot. So sulfur is something that needs to be continually ingested, continually active within the body because it allows for so many bodily functions to operate at maximum efficiency. If you look at sulfur, if you just do a quick Google search, you may find that certain health professionals and doctors, and I'm I'm telling you, many of these websites that you would find that come up at the top of your Google search, they're there for a reason. You know, it's a part of, I guess you can say, of giving a false, uh, false information, you know, that's based upon organizations that are trying to eliminate the truth. So if you just do a quick glance, a quick search for information about sulfur, you may find stuff that is um, exactly in line with what uh, I'm talking about today, or you may find stuff that is in fact the opposite. So while many health professionals are asked about sulfur, and, and I'm talking about the people that are not informed about alternative and advanced health and really here to help the global community and here to see humanity healthy and evolve, they state almost reading from a cue card, you know, we get all the sulfur we need from the food we eat. And, and that was true until man decided to change the way we grow our food and what we feed our crops because it's all interconnected. Plants can store the sulfur. When man eats the plants, they get the sulfur within their body. However, in 1920, Otto Warburg began his study of cancer in both plants and man, for which he received a Nobel Prize. And that he received his Nobel Prize in 1931. He proved that cancer in man is anaerobic. Okay, and you may not know what anaerobic means, but anaerobic, by definition, is cellular metabolism, or uh, I guess splitting or rejuvenation. Um, I guess uh, multiplication without oxygen. Okay, so when cells are trying to multiply, grow, expand, do their jobs, and they don't have ax- oxygen, cancer develops. Free radicals take root and anchor in the body. But but the idea is back in the 1800s and and all the way through ancient times, plants 
were able to, we were able to get our sulfur from the plants because there wasn't as much pollution. You know, after the industrial revolution, things really changed quite a bit, you know, and we have to start to look at the things that we put in our body. And unfortunately, we have to be a little bit more specific, you know, about what we buy, what we find at the grocery store, because these foods are grown in very chemical environments. You know, chemical fertilizer has uh, has almost been re- required in certain governmental legislation and this and that since the 1950s. And then not to eat, not to mention the fact of all the spraying going on in the air right over the crops, you know. So we can't get this reliably from vegetables and, and other fruits and stuff anymore because it just they just does it's not this of the same quality. So the organic sulfur from the cellular matrix study is sourced directly from healthy environments and directly from volcanoes. Okay? And in these volcanoes, in these natural environments, they are not subject to the same pollution and degradation that comes from modern society. And what happens is when you first open up a jar, it's almost like looking into a mirror. It looks so pure and it's the most organic sulfur that can be sourced right now on the planet. That's a great explanation, man. I'm glad you covered all that right up front here. Do we have any idea why organic sulfur is so hard to come by then? You know what? I'll give a little background about why it is so hard to come by based upon Patrick's experiences trying to even begin the study. Because when you look at the difficulties that he had to even begin this study, you'll realize why it is so hard to come by. Okay, so back when he was first beginning, and if you do develop uh, a good relationship with him, with him, if you end up calling him, you know, he, you might, he might even explain this to you, but he didn't have very much money when he began the study, you know, and he, was, and he had children, you know, he was trying to make it. And he was just starting to get his son on sulfur to help try to save his life. Basically, what had happened was, is after he saw it working and or after it has after it worked and he started to make phone calls uh started to talk to certain health organizations um make a website you know put it out there he got a phone call okay he got a phone call from a large vitamin company and what they told Patrick is this they said we'll offer you a million dollars today they were going to offer Patrick a million dollars to disappear, go away, stop trying to uh, expose the benefits of sulfur. So you start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. You know, you can't find sulfur in jewels. You can't find sulfur in uh, Dominic's, any Whole Foods even, you know, even in some of these, um, you know, boutique health stores, you can't find sulfur. So then you start to wonder why Why can you not find something that is so important for the development of the human body and and to maintain the health of the human body? You can't find that in any store that has food or or health products. Everything from skin conditions, you know, uh, um, to to cancer, to arthritis, to cardiovascular diseases, to, to diabetes, to liver, to parasites, to respiratory, glaucoma, hair, teeth, gums, everything all those things are directly related to the lack of sulfur within the body. And when you combine sulfur with other health practices and, and spiritual practices as well, you start to evolve in ways that you can never imagine. But getting back to the to the point of why you can't find this is 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 because these organizations, the government, as many of you may already know, is not out there to help you. They're not out there to give you correct information. They're not out there to to prolong your life. If they were, you wouldn't have McDonald's and McDonald's commercials all the time. You wouldn't have, you know, Walgreens on, on, you know, in every city and everywhere. You wouldn't have all these organizations and all these things, and and let alone the advertising of them. McDonald's commercials, Burger King commercials, Taco Bell, all that stuff, that's made with GMO food. And the government is letting them advertise 
and, uh, and draw customers in. So then you start to put more pieces of the puzzle together. They're advertising and allowing stuff that deteriorates and kills you. And yet they're not giving any information on the stuff that we'll be covering today and, and, and particularly sulfur. So what I'm offering through this, you know, through this broadcast, through this transmission is a way in which you can take control. Each and every one of us will eventually understand, if you don't understand already, that the world as is, the government as is, you know, the, the health organizations and, and pharmaceutical companies as is are not out there to prolong, to save your life, okay? So then where do you find the correct information? You know, where do you find out what are the um, alternative, natural, homeopathic cures and, and medicines that actually work? Because I'm not going to say they all work. I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. They all work better than going and buying some products from Bayer and aspirin and, and all that stuff. There's much better than that. But there are certain products like sulfur that are revolutionary and they attack all sorts of issues head on like nothing else. But just so I completely um, wrap up that point, yeah, it's, it's just the fact that we live in a world where, you know, as an individual, you have to start taking responsibility once you know that the things out there are not there to help and heal you. And that's pretty much, I mean, why sulfur isn't really out there and, and well-known could be, you can look at the opposite. Why is McDonald's out there and well-known? Why, why are all these other companies out there and well-known? You see that, okay, it's something that actually works. Usually the stuff that works, the stuff that is the best will be occult or hidden or kept under wraps and, and it's hard to find and smeared or misinformation is all over the place about it. And so that is the best, I guess you can say, explanation I have uh, uh, to that question, Ryan. Okay. A couple points I want to make about that, though. I do think pharmaceutical companies want to prolong your life, but only temporarily for a few years and only so they can suck more money out of you. And obviously only through artificial means, you know, with synthetic chemicals. Well, this, this, is, this is how I would respond to that is, is the human life in terms of how long a human being can survive and, and live, it should be well over 100 years old. I'm, I'm not talking about that certain pharmaceuticals will can help prolong your life for 5, 10, 15 years. I'm talking about living far past 100 years old. A lot of those things are quick fixes. They're band-aids. I'm not saying that if you take certain pills or certain this or that, it won't help short term. And if you need that short term relief and you can't really find anything else, of course, you know, and, you know, do what you can. You know, there's there's no reason to um to judge yourself, you know, or, or to feel guilty or anything. I'm talking about a whole new level of of human evolution through sulfur. A human beings should not be dying at 80, 90 years old. That's not natural. If that's happening, you're not receiving the nutrients and stuff that you need. But there is also a very spiritual side to this. And, and I have to touch on that right now because I believe it is directly related to what we're talking about in concerning prolonging human life. In that when you're in the flow, there's something that me and a couple others call in the flow. When you're in the flow, you're accessing a level of energy that nourishes you. It feeds you. You have access to an infinite supply um, you know, but the idea is sometimes we're cinching it off, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting it off when you're participating in an activity that is not pulling that life force energy through you, you're expending it without replenishing it. And that is why you need sleep. And that is something that we have really figured out. You need to sleep because you tire yourself out from doing things that you don't really want to do. It is also about your thoughts and your words. They too can expend more energy than they can replenish. So you want to also pay close attention to what you're focusing on and what you're talking about because you ultimately want to be in the flow. And being in the flow means activating the energy that you have access to. You know, when you're in the flow, the amount of energy that you access exceeds the amount of energy that you expend. And you can feel that. 
an example of being in the flow would be just dancing, you know, with a loved one, you know, just doing art, you know, truly being in the moment, not thinking about anything else and lo- loving so much what you're doing, you're practically living out of time. The idea is you're an infinite being. You have access to an infinite amount of energy that we live in a world in a society where so many people are doing stuff that they don't want to have to do all the time, every day. I'm subject to that too. There's stuff that, you know, that I necessarily, you know, have to do on a day-to-day basis that I'm not necessarily too happy about or whatever, but I'm learning just as everybody else is to not have resistance towards what is happening because that creates, I guess you can say, a, a blockage. But now getting just a little bit back to, um, to, to sulfur and, and what you're saying about how, you know, not all pharmaceuticals um, do not prolong life. I, I totally agree in, in the sense of how we know it now. When you study some ancient teachings, you know, some occult information, you know, some ancient Chinese uh, uh, medicine and, and qigong and stuff like that. In fact, there was a qigong expert that died recently, about four or five years ago. He was 120 years old, and he never took sulfur, I believe, a day in his life, you know, but he just moved the air through him. You know, he did qigong each and every day. So I'm not trying to, um, how should I put it, give information. This information is not, if you put it into practice, you will not die at 80 or 90 years old. You could not help but live far past 100. And that's what I'm trying to, and that's what sulfur does. And, and that's the infer, and that's the type of healing, you know, I'm delivering here today. You're talking about how human beings are not meant to die at 80 or 90. And I look at someone like David Rockefeller, who's 101 years old. And I mention him because you mentioned to me off air that the Rockefeller Foundation may have been involved in this movement that resulted in the decision that effectively removed sulfur naturally from our crops, or at least severely lessened the plant's ability to retain sulfur. Oh yes, and 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 like many people know, they they won't have to study, they won't have to research for too long to see uh, how, I guess you can say the uh, the hold, the grip the Rockefeller organization has on pretty much every single government and especially the United States government, especially, you know, you have the Rothschilds and all, and all those guys over in Europe and stuff like that, that and and East Asia and stuff like that. And there, of course, there are all these, I guess you can say big financial institutions and number. And and also I want to make very clear that the people really that were pulling the strings here on the planet, we never knew their name. We never saw their faces, you know. But the idea is they had pawns. The Rockefeller organization, the Rockefellers, they were pawns. You know, the Rothschilds, they were pawns. They were not the bosses of what was really happening. But Because if you're in the public eye, if the public even knows about you, you're a public figure of a higher boss, okay? But getting right to the point, in the 1920s, it was related to chemical fertilizer. If you if you check it out and do a little bit of research, you'll find that sulfur, an elimination of sulfur from public knowledge and from health food stores, etc., uh, that was related to also chemical fertilizer. Because the thing is, you'll be able to get sulfur in your body naturally through plants, vegetables, fruits, etc., but he couldn't effectively, now this is important, he couldn't effectively remove sulfur from the public without implementing chemical fertilizers into the farm uh, and and agricultural industries because they go hand in hand. How could you? How could you eliminate uh, sulfur effectively without completely changing the way plants are, are fed and grown? Because otherwise you're just wasting your time because people would still get their sulfur through the through the fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. So that's what happened around the 1920s, around 1900 to 1920s, is um, that removal. And also, I want to make very clear, you know, if people had longer lives and they were still healthy, vibrant, they could talk, you know, they didn't have dementia, Alzheimer's, all these diseases, they would be extremely wise, extremely knowledgeable individuals. And they don't want that. Why would you want a bunch of people that have been around for for 100 or or more years or 90 or more years that are healthy, that can talk, that remember, that's a threat. 
because they're extremely smart, they're extremely wise, and they can use their experiences to help educate the younger generations. Personally, my grandma can't speak right now. She can't talk because of dementia, and we're trying to get, you know, to get her on sulfur and other things. But the idea is she has wealth of information, of life of experiences. And the idea is we need our elderly community to start to be healthy and to and to repair the damage that is done through, you know, what we put in our body. And but but nevertheless, yes, the Rockefeller organization had a pivotal role in why this information is not available right now and also why it is so difficult to even begin to to sell and dist- and distribute sulfur and start any type of study or conduct any type of medical experiments with it, Ryan. You mentioned spirituality earlier, and I, I do obviously think that ties into health and well-being. And But when you, when you think about some of the ancient cultures that we know of, whether it's Egypt or Sumeria or Atlantis even, you know, the quote-unquote ascended masters that came from these cultures like Thoth, Hermes, they're treated like gods, but who's to say that they weren't just mortal men that lived a long time because they knew how to properly take care of themselves. I am so excited that you that you uh, and asked that type of question. The ex- ascended masters, and personally, I work with um, whether you whether you believe in it or not. It's very real, very real, and I always say to people, try something yourself before you doubt it. I you know I work with Violet Flame. Master Saint Germain all the time, and Archangel Metatron, and, and other and other Thoth and other Thoth and other beings. But the idea is, they started right where we are. They were right where we are. They were in the positions that we are. They may not have had the same adversity that we have to break through now, but everything is energy. Everything is vibration. Then you say, okay, I'm energy. Thoth is energy. Everything is frequency. Everything is you know the table is energy. The, the, the chair that I'm sitting on is energy. You know, the only difference in between these objects and stuff is the density and rate of vibration. Okay, so the difference between you and thought and other beings in higher dimensions is their frequency, their rate of vibration. Their vibration is higher than anything you can perceive in the entire universe. You can travel throughout the entire universe for eternity. And you would never run into those beings because how this is organized is almost like an, uh, a building with elevator. You, you travel up in an elevator, right, to another floor, another frequency, another dimension. And then you, evolve, then you learn, you experience, you evolve. And then you figure out how to raise your frequency even higher. Then you get back in the elevator and you go up. We are nothing more than, than, than leaving the, the third dimension right now and, and are pretty much in between the fourth and the fifth. You don't have to look very far to even realize that because you see the crumbling of social structure right now. You see the crumbling uh, of governments. You see all sorts of things happening. You can even look up at the sky and you will see some sunsets that will blow your mind and that were not, they're not the same as they were when you're growing up as a kid. So the difference between these beings is, is, is nothing more than frequency and their rate of vibration. And so that's, even why I got into, and a little bit about myself, that's even why I got into figuring out and trying to find um, um, these certain products because I had the spiritual practices down. And I'm not you know, telling anybody to do anything. All I'm doing here is showing you a dartboard. So when you're ready to throw your darts, when you realize that maybe I can – Start making some experiments with my life. You know where to throw those darts to hit the right, to 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 get the right um to get the right effect. So the idea is that there's nothing stopping you from from anything you want to become, any anything you want to be. It's all a blank slate. You can create whatever reality you want to experience. You can be whoever you want to be, and you can perceive yourself now. This is this is the trick, Ryan. This is what most people get caught up. They say I have to do a certain. My, I have to do this, that, and the other in order to get to Thoth state or to get to uh, St. Germain state. Yes and no. You know, yes and no. What the idea is you can perceive, you have an idea of what you look like. 
or what you perceive yourself to be, or what you believe that you like, what you don't like, okay? And that, that's all based upon your perception. And that perception radiates outwards, and the world perceives you how you perceive yourself, okay? So when you say, in this moment now, I perceive myself as my ascended version, my ascended master version, you will literally feel a shift in energy within your body. You know, when you no longer perceive yourself as who you think you are, but who you know you are because you're everything, who you know you are, then a shift occurs energetically within your body. But all these ancient cultures, like 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 Ryan brought up, um, um, ancient Egypt, uh, Sumeria, even um, the Aztec uh, 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 civilizations, and over there in Central and South America, the idea is all these ancient societies, we have the ability to pull on that knowledge and start to reformulate the collective consciousness because we're all connected. The human collective is, um, <laughs> I don't know if many people have watched Star Trek or anything, but like the Borg, it's not just quite like the Borg, but the idea is every thought, every feeling, every emotion is shared between every human being on earth. So when me and Ryan are talking or you're uh, are talking about expansive information concerning sulfur or spirituality, whatever it may be, it affects every human being on earth like a domino effect, you know. And so when you pull all this ancient information um, and all the stuff that they knew about from the ancient days, I mean, come on, the golden the pyramid is built directly uh, to the golden ratio. The golden ratio is a healing frequency. They knew. They knew stuff that we are just starting to uncover. I, I hope that a little bit answers your question, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned too earlier, working with St. Germain, you mentioned the violet flame, and you described yourself as a violet flame alchemist. Could you talk a little bit more about that, what that means and what that practice entails? So violet, purple, is the highest vibrational color in our visible uh, uh perception okay so the highest vibrational color that we can perceive with our eyes with human eyes is purple and 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 if you look at ancient history and history that was around in the renaissance time royalty people that were you know uh, of high born or kings or queens they wore a lot of purple it resembles also royalty because they they understood that purple was a sign of almost like um perfection so Purple is the highest vibrational color and the frequency. Now, we go to the flame part. You put, the, you put the two together. So you take the flame, which in alchemy it resembles transmutation. And, and also really quick, um, quick, I just want to touch on the three ground uh, basis uh, uh, minerals or whatever you want to call it of alchemy was salt, mercury, and um, sulfur. What was Sulfur, right? Yeah, I forget the one, the one that the one that we're talking about exactly. No, salt, mercury, and sulfur, and, and this goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. So they knew about some stuff that we are just starting to uncover. So you have the flame, which is transmutation. You have the violet flame, which is the highest frequency vibrational color. And now we know through the talk already that our body is energy, that everything's vibrating frequency. So, and also magic uh, was a hermetic. Science, it was taught everywhere back in the ancient days. Magic is not what we think it is. Magic is very real, and it's something that is a science. Putting it into practice, you will see the results. But the idea is the violet flame transmutes. You invoke it, and it transmutes your body to a higher vibrational frequency. And you do this through visualization, the spoken word, meditation, all those practices. I, I know that each and every person will has different ways in order to get to the same, uh, to the tip of the mountain. I'm not saying that this is something that everybody must do to, to get there. I'm saying that this is something that I've used to achieve rapid evolution uh, in consciousness and, in, and in, uh, in my physical body. But nevertheless, you invoke the violet flame, you visualize it. You visualize your whole body practically just burning with violet fire, transmuting everything of a low frequency to a high frequency. Now, this is what spiritual alchemy is all about. You know, it was smeared 
<laughs> um, like many of you know, just like sulfur and, and other things that actually are powerful and work, just like magic and other things that are occult. It was smeared to give people a false sense of reality. So the violet flame, when you invoke its power, you're starting to figure out how to properly use your vehicle, this human body suit, your thoughts, your words, your beliefs, all those things are tools. They're not just part of your experience. They're literally manifestation tools. So when you start to use how this, this body works in relationship to your, to your consciousness anchored in the body, you start to become a conscious, empowered creator. And that's what this life is. That, that's what evolution and, and thought and everything, that's what everyone was trying to teach us. They're trying to teach us, okay, you're alive. You're here now. You, want, you chose to be here to grow, to learn, whatever. But the idea is you're trying to learn how to become a conscious, empowered creator of your own experience and instantly manifest anything that you can possibly put your mind to that is in relationship to the frequency you hold. But here's the catch. There's a governor almost on your body, on your consciousness, so that you're not out of alignment and you have that power. Because, like one of the greatest quotes of all time, great power comes great responsibility. So pretty much all, all the humans on earth, have we have on training wheels. We've had on training wheels for thousands of years, so we don't cause massive destruction. But now we're learning how to take off those training wheels and walk for the first time. Absolutely, man. And just to wrap up the point on, you know, you mentioned purple being a very royal and regal color just in our material world here. I saw Hillary Clinton wore a lot of purple during her campaign here. Like you said, it's been in royal families as one of their colors for centuries. And also people should know when you are taught at a young age, the colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, violet is always the last one. It's, it's, it's the highest one. It coincides also, I believe, with the crown chakra, right? Yeah, the crown chakra is big. It's your relationship to the divine, okay? Your root chakra anchors you uh, to the earth. They're all important. They're all very important. And you know what's really cool is that you can find on Meditative Mind channel on YouTube a nine-hour frequency uh, binaurals that I, I personally listen to binaurals every night for the past year. And every single night I have binaural beats going and I wake up and I feel so refreshed. But the idea is Meditative Mind Channel on YouTube has nine hours of, of root, sacral, you know, heart, throat, crown chakra, um, meditation frequency music. And you can use these to heal and invigorate each and every one of your chakras. Yeah, you know, sound therapy, sound healing, vibrational healing is something that I've really gotten into recently. I've been actually working on this side project that's going to be like a certain type of episode for this podcast called a binaural blog where I just do a spoken word audio blog over binaural beats. I have no idea if it will be effective, but I at least want to introduce the concept of people listening to binaural beats more often in their lives because it's been very beneficial to me and mine and from the way it sounds for you too. It you know what? That idea is amazing, Ryan. It really is because when you're delivering information – which is, which is very useful and, and also very spiritual as well as very scientific. When you're delivering this information and you have something like that going on in the background, I believe certain doorways will open and certain connections will be made for the listeners. And just to tie up um, a couple in terms of frequencies and where to find the best ones, because I've, I've, I've literally, I remember I told my roommate back a year or two ago, I was like, hey, dude, like, I'm going to listen to binaural beats every night, every day for a whole month, just for an experiment. And he was like, cool, man, you know, whatever. But that developed into me. I never stopped ever for ever since last night, night before, all the way back up into a year. I've listened to binaural beats every single night. And, you know, so it has a big effect when you combine the what you ingest with frequency, with um, with um, the violet flame, with certain practices, with believing in yourself, you literally are becoming God. Well, you already are, depending on what you believe. I, I believe everything is interconnected. Uh, I mean, so as, as above, as so below, as within, as so without, that you are an expression of all that is living in human form. There's no such thing as separation. 
we create separation in order to experience all that is because you can create separation so this whole human experience all this stuff is about diving into separation you know people thinking they're separate from one another they're separate from the environment they're separate from their from people from the from their family from this and that i live in my body you live in your body and we're completely separate but that couldn't be farther from the truth eventually you will awaken and realize that we are all so interconnected, and when we help each other, we change the world. Well put. You also mentioned Ormus to me off the air, and I wanted to talk about that for a moment because I don't know what to make of it. It has roots in alchemy. The process is very alchemical. This is something that when you search it online, it comes off kind of hokey, but the science behind it seems very legit. And the story behind this discovery, or its modern discovery, is long. So let me abbreviate it real quick before we start talking about it. Ormus was discovered by a farmer in the 1970s in Arizona, uh, this guy named David Hudson, and he had noticed some very strange materials in his soil while working on his farmland. No one can figure out what it is. Labs are testing it. No one knows. Hudson spends several million dollars over the course of a few years to try to figure out what this material is and how it works. And finally, it turns out that it's a group of precious metal elements in different atomic states, the monoatomic state. And without going too much further into the science of that, because I don't think either of us know that much about it, but what do you know about Ormus, and have you had any experience with it? The idea is Ormus stands for Orbally Rearranged Monatomic Elements, or M-State Elements. It is made from water uh, and other substances. It is the most refined salt from spiritual locations around the earth that are not so affected by pollution, for example, the Himalayas and Tibet. That's where pretty much most Ormus suppliers source their salt from. And basically what happens is you use a sort of catalyst, a sort of lye. Um, I believe there's the Egyptian method, which uses something similar to baking soda, if not baking soda itself. And what it does is it cracks open, I guess, almost like a doorway within the, the, the salt. And, and when it combines it, the lye almost corrodes and breaks it down and opens up a doorway in which this other substance uh, can take shape and take form. And this is not a gimmick. This is, this is truth. You can watch on YouTube. You can watch other videos. In fact, Trevor Seven has a fantastic video on YouTube of how to make your own Ormus. And you can see it literally take shape from thin air into the glass. And this particular um, practice, or, or the way to make it, came from ancient Egypt. And as many people know, in ancient Egypt, in the temples were certain rooms that helped facilitate spiritual transformation and, and ascension. So, and this substance does that. And, th and this is the catch. Some Ormus suppliers have a kind of watery substance. It's supposed to be thick and almost milky. But so you take it, I, I just take about a cap full, maybe two, 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 two times a day. And I'll tell you right now, the first thing you'll start to realize, if not in about two or three days, maybe, maybe four days, is you'll begin to have a completely different relationship with the dream state. You remember everything, every detail, you know, and you have much more control of what you do in your dream state. It's vivid, the, the most highest resolution ever, and it heals the body. People have reported growing their hair back at 60, 70 years old that lost pretty much all their hair, scars, you know, disappearing. So there's something there. But Ormus has received almost even more misinformation and smearing than sulfur has. When I first looked up Ormus, I was hesitant. I was hesitant to try it for the first time because of, of all the misinformation out there. And, and these government agencies literally pay for people to, to fill the in internet up with misinformation and, and false stories and stuff like that. So, Yeah, and if I could just cut in here for a second, when I looked up Ormus several years ago, it did come off like some hokey, you know, new age bullshit, like I said. But when you read the story behind this discovery, as I briefly outlined, and the more I read about the science behind it, the less crazy it sounded to me. And the more I learned about alchemy in general, the more I thought of what Paracelsus called the tria prima or tria prima, the three primes of alchemy, sulfur, mercury, and salt. I think we touched on this earlier. And we've already talked about sulfur. We're talking about ormus, which has to do with salt. And 
I don't know where the Mercury comes in exactly, but I do know that another name for Mercury in Greek is, I, I think, Hydra, Hydra Gyrum or Hydra Gyrum. I'm not sure how you say it, but it's an amalgam of the words Hydra meaning water. And again, I'm going to butcher this, Argyros. It looks like Argyros, A-R-G-Y-R-O-S, or Argyros if you're into sandwiches. But anyways, that, that's an amalgam of, of water and the Greek words for water and silver. So silver water. So maybe mercury is colloidal silver or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe it's just eating a lot of fucking fish. But yeah, to support your point, I have noticed the information out there on Ormus is, is very hard to sort through. So discernment is key. Didn't want to cut you off there, but just wanted to make that point. No, excellent. Um, I really, I really appreciate you, um, you clearing that up and, and emphasizing that to people because I had the same experience when I was first looking into Ormus myself. You know, I there was so much um, misinformation everywhere. It almost made you afraid to, to to try it for yourself for the first time. And then, you know, a couple months later, you know, something for for some reason I would research it again. And then a couple months later, I'd research it again. I'm like, all right. I'm going to just try, give this a try, you know, I'm going to try it out. And personally, if, if I had the chance or if I had the ability, I would never have not had a bottle ready to go so ever since I started using it because it works so well. You start to feel the environment around you. You start to feel the trees moving. You start to feel the plants breathing. You start to feel the animals moving. And you start to feel f- like I remember I had a cat that lived in my old house when I first started to take Ormus and I would literally be laying in my bed and I would hear the cat walking like three rooms away. And I know that never happened to me before. So I believe one of the main things that also has a big effect on is your sensory perception. It takes your sensory perception through the roof. And off air too, you mentioned um, just casually that you work a lot with crystals and that you're actually making your own organite device or something. Could you maybe talk more about that? Yeah, in fact, um, you know, just just for a living, um, to, to make money, not necessarily just to make money, of course, that's, that's not, I guess that's not the whole idea is, the whole the idea is I wanted to be able to support myself off of being able to help the world um, through certain products. And I already bought Organite, and I was able to work with Organite on a day-to-day basis. I kept it in my pockets at all times because like many people may or may not know is Organite creates a barrier, almost a shield against EMFs. And at the same time, it detoxes the body from EMFs. Really helps detox the body of, I guess you can say, frequencies that have taken root and uh, damaging negative frequencies that have taken root in the body. You know what I mean? And it also protects you. I mean, come on, we have cell phone towers, we have meters in our houses, we have, you know, all this technology that is constantly bombarding our body. And now that we remember our body's energy, it is affected by all those frequencies that are bombarding us. And as we also may know, the people that own all those companies can tune the frequencies to be very harmful to our body. So when you keep organite around, it creates a barrier and allows for the ormus, for the sulfur, for all these other things to work that much better because it prevents further damage. But organite, what it is, the definition of organite is um, inorganic materials compressed in a resin with crystals, uh, different formations of crystals to achieve whatever type of uh, effect that you're looking for. And you compress it into a, a, most of the time it's into a pyramid or a circular device. And you keep that on you. And, and it has a big effect, but if people, for people that do meditate and, and you're able to achieve, you know, just not, not necessarily the deepest meditators, but you're able to achieve a meditative state and you hold the organite in your hands, you will feel it pulsing, just like you'll feel a crystal pulsing. And so I have, you know, a crystal grid and I work with all those things all the time. I sleep with them right by my bed. Um, but these things are living. Organite, I don't know necessarily its uh, consciousness and how living that device necessarily is. As more, I believe it's a tool, but crystals are very alive. Not to get in here again, but I've been reading a lot recently about restructuring water by pouring it over crystals. And the reasoning uh, or the science behind that is spot on with what you said. The crystals are alive. The water obviously is too, but it's been so polluted and the crystals sort of regenerated to its natural state. 
Wow. I mean, this couldn't you couldn't have led into um to another topic better than that, Ryan. Okay, so the body is 70 to 80% water. We know that as a fact. And the water we put in our body, I mean, it's, it's really important because it becomes, you know, a, a part of our body, a, a part of our system. And now we also know that the tap water and, and the stuff coming out of, you know, the drains and our showers and stuff is very harmful. Um, I personally have not had a chance to buy a shower filter, even though I really want to, and all these other filters. But what I do do is this, and it's in fact something that I was going to share on my Instagram and teach people in the Chicago area how to do. And that is how to restructure and crystallize your water, distilled water. You can buy a gallon of distilled water for like maybe a dollar, dollar fifty. Uh, at most stores because it doesn't matter as much the quality of the distilled water you buy because it completely changes by the time it sits overnight in, your, in, your, in this jar. So you buy a two-gallon jar, glass container. You put your, a certain crystal composition in it, whatever crystal composition you really want. You throw those in there. You pour distilled water in there, and you buy some shungite. Shungite is a mineral from Russia. It's a black, non-crystalline mineraloid and it is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, water purifiers on the face of the earth. In fact, Russian princes and Russian royalty used to go swimming in springs that were right on top of all the shungite because they believed it rejuvenated the body and it was the fountain of youth. So you grab some shungite, not raw shungite. It has to be smoothed out, you know, not so it's going to get chalky or whatever. It's smoothed out. You throw that in there. So you have your crystals, you have your shungai, you pour distilled water in there, which is very clean in, in, in respect to other types of water you can buy. So it's already very pure. And then you crystallize and restructure it. Let it sit overnight. And you drink that water? My God, Ryan, it heals your body so much. And and, and yes, touching on the, the what exactly what you said, crystallized water heals your body like no other. But and also and also just to lead on to that before you um before you ask your, your next question and a little bit about water and health and stuff, you know, we do not need to eat as much as we need to eat. Now, it's, it's fun. I, I love food. <laughs> don't, don't get me started. I absolutely love um, the taste of food. I, I, there's a restaurant over here in Chicago called Karen's that's out of this world. You know, it's raw, organic, vegan. I mean, well, it's not always raw, but it's organic, vegan, and it's just – it's amazing. I love food, so don't get me wrong. But like I said, I'm, I'm all for experiments and right before I started this, uh, started talking to Ryan about having our podcast together, I started a new experiment. And now I fast uh, about every other day or, or three or four times a week. And so far, the results have been amazing. My energy is through the roof. Uh, my connection to, 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 to the spirit and the divine is through the roof. It's really quite interesting how, you know, we have gone to believe that through eating food, we receive our energy. But at the same time, we expel energy to digest the food. So if you can pull forth energy from your crystals like we're talking about, or energy from your practices, or just completely get immersed in your art, your dancing, whatever you love to do, you don't really need that much food. And that energy that was spent digesting and processing the food can be used elsewhere. But yeah, drink, drink crystallized water. That reminds me of something. I read this study recently, a government-funded study out of Europe, I think. And they had studied people who claimed to have a good quality of life in terms of loving relationships. They had found in the study that people who claimed that they were in love had less desire to eat. Their appetites were not as great, and biologically they were just as healthy or, in some cases, healthier than people who were eating vegetarian or vegan diets. I don't know if I'm quoting that study accurately, but I think that's the gist of it. And it seems to me now that the entire premise of our conversation here is balance. You have to have balance. You have to have spiritual balance, but also material balance. I mean, we are living in a material world, so we have to make better choices when it comes to what materials we consume or ingest. I think that's what ancient cultures knew that we've forgotten. I mean, they seem to get along just fine without GMOs and pharmaceuticals, and they knew what their bodies and minds and spirits needed in order to thrive, whether it was things like what we've been talking about, sulfur or misstructured water, or even things like psychedelic plants that gave them an ingestible divine experience. It's all here for us already if we know what we're looking for, and if we know how to use it. I mean, we have everything we need here to achieve that balance. 
And we've been talking about minerals you can ingest, and that's it. These are minerals, naturally occurring substances, nothing fancy here. Look at the periodic table. It's all here for us to live healthy, productive, balanced lives full of love. Man, I I absolutely love talking to you, you know. I really do. And you're hidden spot on. Yes, we live in a very material world, and we have created from a different space, from a different level of our being, the structure for how this world will work through sacred geometry. But it's very similar to a, a holodeck with the safety turned off, if you ever watched uh, Star Trek. You know, this is very similar to to a hologram with the safety turned off in that it will, it can affect you. You can feel it, you know, it can, it can, you know, you can feel pain and all that stuff. So yes, everything is energy. Um, and, and everything is constantly changing, but you're totally right. You know, I studied, um, shamanism, druidism, uh, for quite a while because, uh, like I talked to, to Ryan about before is, I spent nearly two years mostly in isolation and out in the woods and out in, by the river in California, and that facilitated my awakening. I was away from the television. I was away from uh, – I, I didn't even bring my phone, so I was away from electronics. I was away from a television, away from power cables. Yeah, the idea is when you get a chance to get away and break away from it all, you know, you, you allow yourself to find yourself again. You know, and I'm not saying that it's necessary for anybody to do that, but shamanism, um, druidism, all that stuff is incredible. You know what I mean? It's honestly, plants are alive and they communicate in such an amazing way. I remember David Wilcock in his book, uh, I, I read his book a couple of years ago. He did an experiment about how uh, the per uh, plant, uh, plants that were in someone's house, when they're when the person that you know owned those plants, I don't I don't really like to say own, but the person that you know um, was around those plants um, experienced pain or different other emotions. The plants would have a measurable scientific reaction to that person's experience, and same with animals and all this stuff. So you have to realize that all these living organic organisms, and even maybe even what we think is inorganic materials, are very conscious, and they are here for us to use and to help us in order for that relationship to work we have to help them you know what i mean the plants i mean not necessarily help them but respect them you know we're cutting down the rainforest at rapid rates i live in chicago right now where i grew up and it, w it was really difficult for me it was very hard for me because during the summer and and from for some of my life the house that i lived at they had a tree right in the yard and our neighbor got a new car and she realized that there was a family of birds living in the tree and it was, um, and they were, you know, pooping or whatever on her, on her new car every once in a while. And so she had the entire tree cut down, you know, and that just shows where humanity is at right now to me. You know, I was very painful for me because I was like, this tree provides shade. It provides a home to other living creatures. You know, when you do something like that, you affect so many other life forms and stuff like that just because you know you don't want any poo on your car like i would have paid for you to get i would have cleaned your car if you know if you would have you know if you wanted but the idea is like we need to start being more respectful you can barely how would you breathe you know the air and the air in some of these major cities is so polluted that it's almost difficult to breathe you know what i mean but people don't notice because they, their body is already so contaminated but we need to start having more respect uh, for nature and for the environment. And when we start having more respect for nature and the environment, nature will start to say, okay, you know, they're, they're starting to get back to where they were uh, in, in Ireland, in ancient Ireland with the Druids or, or with the shamans, you know, in Africa and other places and in ancient Egypt. And now we can give our information back to them. I mean, because I ingested, what is it, psilocybin mushrooms on many occasions. You know, I don't necessarily uh, do it as much as I used to, maybe once a year, maybe once every couple of years, but it awakened me. That was the main thing, Ryan, that changed my life because I saw that reality wasn't what it seems and nobody was telling me the truth. I literally saw, I literally saw it with my own eyes, you know, all these amazing colors, all these amazing, what they call quote unquote hallucinations. And I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. I take, I take uh, one, one, a little bit of uh, LSD or I take um, some psychedelic mushrooms and my whole experience of, of reality changes like that. 
there must be something more going on here. And that led me on pretty much to where we are, we are today, you know? Absolutely. I can personally testify to the point you made earlier about plants and how your personal energy affects them. I used to live with my girlfriend and she would have flowers around the house. And when times were good, when we were happy and our energy was positive, those flowers lived a lot longer than they probably should have and without watering them every day too. But if we would go through some negative moments, you know, a day or two of just fighting or arguing, those flowers would wither and die. And that experience, noticing that, that was part of my awakening process. You know, on the surface, flowers die all the time, right? But when you pay attention to them and notice the correlation between when they're dying and what else is going on around them when they're dying, it doesn't seem like a coincidence anymore. And I think that's a great note to wrap this up on, Satcho. I enjoyed the chat, and I appreciate you taking the time to be here. You're obviously a young dude who seems to be a lot further along the path than most are at your age, definitely further along than I was at that age, and you seem to have a good heart, a good mind, and good intentions, and it was a pleasure meeting you, and I hope you keep doing what you're doing. My pleasure, Ryan. I absolutely loved being on your show today. Uh, it was really my pleasure. It's incredible what you're doing. Keep it up. And I look forward to maybe working with you again in the future and listening to all uh, the podcasts and everything that you're going to be uh, releasing from now on. So, so much love to you, brother. And thanks again for having me on. Well, there you have it. My thanks again to Satchel McMahon. I thought that was a fun, feel-good kind of chat. And Say what you will about what we discussed, but all I can say is don't knock until you try it, I guess. What else I can say is I have been taking the organic sulfur for about six weeks now, and the first two days were fine, but the third and the fourth day, I detoxed pretty hard. I had a headache for two days straight, and you know, overall, I'm very conscious of what I eat and what I put into my body. I'm usually an all-organic, non-GMO kind of guy, but obviously, I had some toxins that needed flushed out. And since then, I have felt better than I did before. My physical energy levels have increased, my thoughts are clearer, and I'm not sure how to say this, but my feelings are clearer. Like, I feel a lot more love in me and around me than I did before. I think I've leveled out. I know that's anecdotal, because during the same time I've also been taking CBD oil, so can I really attribute that feeling to the addition of just sulfur to my diet? I can't say for sure. As far as the cellular matrix study goes, I have recorded an interview with the director of that study, Patrick McGeehan, whom Satchel mentioned, and I'm in the process of cleaning that interview up because we had to record two different times. We did Skype to phone, and the quality was okay, and then we did Skype to Skype, and it was better. But then some of the Skype to phone material was better than the Skype to Skype, so I'm just trying to piece together the best bits of two hour-long conversations, and we'll see how it turns out. But Patrick shares some great science behind sulfur and how it works and how it fleshes out toxins in the body, and it's just a lot more work than I usually have to do for one episode. But it will be online in the next few weeks for those of you who are interested. Now, as for Ormus, I can't personally attest to that. I've never taken it. I've only read about it and heard it discussed for, well, for many years now, actually. I've seen a documentary on it, too. And I've actually reached out to the director of this documentary I've seen called All the Gold You Can Eat. And he actually got back to me um, just earlier today as I was starting to record this. And we're trying to set up a, a day and a time to talk. And regardless of whether we find time to talk, Ormus is a subject I plan on digging more into either on my own or some other guests. I don't know if I'm to the point where I want to try it yet, though. I guess maybe I'm still a little brainwashed against it. I think I need to be convinced a little more. Concerning the whole Violet Flame and working with St. Germain thing that Satchel mentioned, I don't know much about that specifically. I get the visualization and manifestation of the violet flame. I would also guess you could get to the same level of consciousness through basic meditative techniques. But again, I don't know. On the other hand, I have been researching Saint Germain a little bit for the binaural blog that I've been working on because he plays a minor role in the topic I'm researching. And as you may suspect, there's some conflicting information out there on him. 
Is he a saint you want to work with, or is he a saint you want to avoid? I don't know. Again, discernment is key, but the jury's still out for me personally on him. And as for some other things, I'm trying to find a good guest or two, or three, to talk about the consciousness of animals, plants, and water. That's interested me for several years now, and when it popped up in this conversation with Satchel, it reignited my interest in it. So hopefully I can track down some people who know more about that than I do. I'm also just now getting into crystals and restructuring water. I haven't done it yet, but I've been making a lot of notes about it, trying to find the best crystals to use. And not just for restructuring water, but just, I guess, for general healing purposes. Although I suspect maybe the crystals that are the best healers are also the best water restructurers. I don't know. I haven't got that far yet. And honestly, how about Satchel being only 23? You know, say what you will about that, but his general message, you know, respecting nature, respecting your body, just the general message of love and compassion, you know, I wasn't thinking that way in my early 20s. I was eating absolute garbage, was drunk half the time, spent hours watching TV and playing video games. I wasn't studying spirituality or ascended master teachings or talking to anyone about alchemy and how important minerals are to your health and well-being. So, like I told Satchel, you know, kudos to him for following that path at an early age, and I wish I would have went down the health and wellness and spiritual path a little sooner. And to my point about material and spiritual balance, I can't underscore how important I found that to be. I mean, look around you. We've advanced materially in major, major ways. But have we done the same spiritually? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or whatever network you're listening on. If you are an iTunes user and you like what you heard, drop a good rating on there for me. Or email me at oculturepodcast at gmail.com. Tell me what's working. Tell me what's not working. I appreciate any and all feedback. There's also links to our social media profiles in the show notes. If you're the liking and following type, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat. You can also check out oculturepodcast.com. But either way, whether I see you out there in the social sphere or not, my thanks to you for being here. You've been listening to a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.